Good morning, church and church online. If you're here with us in the building, I want to remind you to put your masks on as we sing. We'd really appreciate it. I love you, Jesus. Your light shines through. Go.
you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Come on, church. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, 
surrender ourselves. We surrender ourselves to the name of Jesus. And we say your ways are higher. Your thoughts are higher. So God, we surrender and we submit ourselves to you, Lord. I want us just to take literally 30 seconds. one area that you feel is just like, man, God, I feel so overwhelmed in this. One area could be your marriage, could be your family, could be your finances, could be your kids, could be your job. Pick that one thing. And now in your mind's eye, that word. Draw a line over it and Jesus on top. Jesus over financial issues. Jesus over family issues. Jesus over my health issues. Jesus is over it all. He is over it all. He's over it all. And Father, we declare in the name of Jesus that anything that would exalt itself above you, it must bow and surrender to the name of Jesus. We speak Jesus provider, Jesus healer, Jesus restorer, Jesus all sufficient one, Jesus my peace, Jesus, my strong tower. Jesus, my shield. Jesus, my firm foundation. Come on, you are over it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. God is so good. So good. As you find your seats this morning, just say a quick hello to someone who's six feet around you. <laughs> Come on, isn't God so faithful? It's like my soul needed that this morning. <laughs> it's good to remind yourself about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, who God is, and for us to fully embrace that. You know, there's a scripture in Hebrews 13, 5, and at the very end it says, you know, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. You know, be happy with what's going on around you. But in the middle of it all, where it seems like chaos or Whatever is happening, like everything we had just talked about said, God will never leave you or forsake you. He's not going to leave you high and dry. When you run to him and put him over it all, he's faithful. Amen? Amen. We want to welcome anyone who is a guest with us this morning in person or online. We're just so thankful. Yeah, why don't we give them a round of applause? We're so thankful that you're taking time out of your Sunday to spend with us, and we hope so far you've been blessed, and I know that the word is going to encourage you. We have an exciting announcement. We need to announce the bands of marriage. Woo! Two in a row. This is so good. <laughs> uh, people are getting married again. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> we want to announce the bands of marriage of Robert Anderson and Arista Kinkinat on Friday, July 31st at 4 p.m. right here. It's so exciting, an awesome young couple. We're so proud of them. Sadly, because of all the restrictions and seating restrictions, uh, our church family can't attend. It's just um, the seats are reserved for all invited family and friends. However, don't let that stop you from flooding their Instagram and social media accounts. And when you see them, congratulate them from afar high five from your feet, whatever you want to do, but let's not let that stop us from celebrating with them. Amen? I want to encourage you guys to get your notebooks out, a device out, something that you can take notes with, because I know today's word is going to bless you.
All right. How many enjoyed that time of worship? Actually, you know what? I, uh, I like it on this side. <laughs> Getting very picky. It's nice to be back uh, with you after uh, missing last uh, weekend. Celebrated my birthday over the toilet, uh, you know, throwing up. That was awesome. How many thought Mary did an amazing job with a couple hours notice? I was up all night thinking like, the message I have here ready, I thought this isn't one I can just pass off very easily. It's all laid out ridiculously, kind of a gong show. I'm like, what can I get her to do? Like, she's going to have to preach short notice. And uh, so I was watching the live stream. I, you know, we connected at 6 a.m. very briefly, and I suggested some 10-minute thing and then a ministry time. And then I watched the live stream, and I'm like, where did she come up with this? It's like a full message she wrote in two hours. Uh, but that's what happens when you're in your word, walking with God. Can I hear an amen? I want to thank, uh, going back a few weeks now, how many were blessed by Matt Jackson's word a few weeks ago on fatherhood? Uh, my dad, two weeks ago, wasn't it great to hear from him again and the uh, heart, uh, the, the cause of Christ? He's actually going to share later on this year his whole salvation story with you from start to finish. Those of you who've been around a while, you heard that a million times back in the day. How, how many remember his entire, you know, the whole trip, the whole salvation story trip? Yeah, okay, so look at it. That's what I thought. Most of you haven't. You are going to love this story his hippie journey all the way to the Middle East and how we found Jesus. Um, uh, so I, that's going to be exciting to have him, uh, him share with us. Uh, I want to very quickly mention, and I'm going to have to dive in and keep my eye on the time so they can get this thing uploaded. Josh Rooster is ready to run in here and just flag me down if I start going too long. Uh, I want to uh, make quick mention, you would have heard that a, a mask bylaw was passed, and there's uh, reams and reams and reams of exemptions. I've been plowing through them all to see how it affects us as a church. Our team will look through them and lay things out here as necessary. Uh, but I just want to remind you, you'll see the signage going up starting next weekend uh, as far as that goes. Uh, there are a whole bunch of exemptions the city has included, so you will, I guarantee you, see people without masks. In fact, the little sign the city made us, uh, wrote up for us, and they want us to post, it says right on it, be very kind and respectful to those not wearing masks. They don't want like, you know, like the Facebook policing vibe, we don't need that in real life, right? They'll, they'll leave that on there. Uh, they have a, just a real good plan they've come up with. Thankfully, I looked up uh, on the city's website, and this is exempt, this area up here, so the worship leaders can say amen to that. Public speakers are exempt, I'm saying amen to that. Uh, imagine trying to preach through a mask. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we're going to uh, keep having church, and those of you who are in masks, I think it's a small sacrifice to make to worship God and come meet God for an hour. Can I hear an amen from you? I see people going to Walmart, beach days, pool parties, Fortinos, you know, park hangouts, all sorts of stuff. You can surely once a week throw on a mask and come to church and meet with God. Amen? Those of you watching at home, sign up and come join us next week. It's going to be a great uh, weekend. The last thing I want to do before I dive in here is give a shout out to our teenagers in this church. Man, Friday night they had their first, yeah, woohoo, who can holler it up for them? They had their first, uh, you know, big group meeting back at Gage Park since uh, March, really, since the shutdowns uh, started. They had a worship night. Uh, obviously, our auditorium is already set up uh, nicely for spaced out worship. And my kids came home just flying. Like the presence of God was there. We didn't even get to the preaching time because songs of the Lord were coming and songs about revival and people were on their knees and like they met God. I heard from several other teenagers who were like, it was a lit night. It was amazing. Come on, guys, keep pressing into God. I believe God wants to bring a revival to your generation. How many agree with me this morning? There is something he's doing in the hearts of people right now, and it, the youth are going to be on the front lines of it. Parents, I encourage you to be leading and modeling for your kids what it is to press in to the presence of God. Prioritize the presence of God. I was just so excited to hear uh, the turnout they had and the, the, the atmosphere and the presence of God in the place. Teenagers, come on, keep it up. Uh, you are going to lead the charge. Amen? Now, I want to share with you here this morning on the a heart for the cause. A heart for the cause. My dad shared a message called, Is There Not a Cause? And I want us to shift gears into the heart because it is literally impossible to accomplish the cause of Christ unless we let him have our heart. Literally, we've got to let him have our heart. 
And I'm going to attempt <laughs> to zip through four uh, thoughts here, four points uh, with you here this morning. Uh, there are some uh, recap notes on our app, but I would encourage you to jot some things down. Uh, and most of all, I would ask you, have an open heart right now, because I believe God wants to come and speak to you. How many are ready to receive from the Lord this morning? Amen. First thing I want to look at is true values. <clears throat> Did you know that we all have statements of belief that we would say we believe in our lives? But a statement of belief does not become a value or a conviction until it's actually lived out. So here's an easy example that most of us can relate to. I just turned 43, and uh, I've noticed over the years that um, I have to watch this area. Those of, you who, those of you who remember when I was a kid and a teenager, I was just a bone rack. I didn't have to, I could eat like a pig and not ever worry about, uh, you know, weight. So, here's a statement of truth. I need to exercise, you know, walk regularly, um, you know, go on more bike rides, watch what I eat, the, the night eats. Anybody else notice, like, past 8.30? You can eat like a pig all day long, but everything that goes in your mouth past 8.30 lands right here and doesn't budge. Anybody else, right? The night eats sit on the lower stomach. It's amazing. I used to go for burgers at midnight and just have a good old time and no problem now. But past 8.30, I mean, I wake up the next day just a mess. So I know all that, but if I don't exercise, if I don't watch what I eat, if I don't actually change the lifestyle, it hasn't become a conviction. It's a statement of truth. It is a true statement, and I should get off my duff and do it, and I am, by the way, but I'm just saying. If, if you have statements like this in your life that you believe, and Christians can often deceive ourselves on this front because we know so much about the Word of God. We can, we can recite all kinds of Scripture, but until it's being lived out, it's not yet a conviction. I love the messages the last three weekends, right? Mary encouraging us last weekend uh, like she did on uh, not being given to fear and just, you know, be, being sure that we're abandoning ourselves to God. My, my dad talking about truly living your life for the cause of Christ. Matt talking about truly living uh, to be an example to the next generation and to bless our community. Those messages were filled with things that have become values and convictions. Statements of truth, but also values uh, and convictions. And around here, we try to do our best, right, to not preach theoretical messages. I, I want you to be able to take things home and live it out. That's where these things become convictions. Now, first tip, <clears throat> make the Bible the foundation for your life convictions. Make the Bible your foundation, the basis for your convictions and your values. Because the Bible deals with our heart. Your personal opinions on all kinds of other non-scriptural things are just, they're irrelevant, honestly, like, don't, no offense, but like our opinions on, you know, what color you'll rather the walls be, what kind of food you like or don't like, doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to the cause of Christ. Our values must be based in Scripture. And I'll share a few more examples before I shift into the heart, because I really believe as Christians, especially this day and age we live in, we've got to get our values straightened away. We've got to know what our convictions are uh, and how to live them out. Here's another statement for you. Values are true values when they can be universally applied. It's not really a value in my mind, at least, if it can only be applied in certain circumstances. So, for example, I believe God wants us to respect and love all people. Yes, even people who drive me bonkers and who are annoying as all get out. And you all have people in your life, be real, who are annoying and drive you bonkers. The Bible doesn't give you any off-ramp somewhere to say, okay, well, in that case, you can be extremely rude to them. You don't have to, uh, you know, respect them or, or show the love of Christ. No, we're called to love all people, love God, love people. It has to be universally uh, applied. Every human being is created in the image of God, which is why for me, it is just super simple and straight up, I oppose abortion. Because I believe God creates every single person in his image. Why should I get to choose that 50 million babies every year around the world are aborted? I, I'll apply that value equally across the board all day long. I remember years ago, somebody in our church, uh, many, many years ago, came up to me, a real, uh, you know, just an amazing person, um, you know, back in the day in our church. And they said, did you hear about this new mosque? They're planning to build downtown. 
which I had, my wife and I live right near it, a couple blocks from it. This is many years back. I said, yeah, I've heard about that. I live right near there, actually. I'm watching kind of the, you know, the beginnings of that project. And they said to me, I think we need to like start a petition that they shouldn't be allowed to open that in our city. I don't want people going to a mosque. And I said, well, I have to kindly disagree with you there because at City Hall, they're considered a place of worship. And if you start to petition that a place of worship can't be built or opened, then who's to stop somebody from petitioning that we can't open a place of worship or some other religion can't open a place of worship? I I can't really go there because my value is I absolutely believe in religious freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of opinion, freedom to come and do this. So I can't now pick and choose, well, I I don't really believe in what you believe in that religion, so I'm going to oppose that, but don't you dare turn around and try to oppose mine. It doesn't work. And so I remember this person kind of thought for a minute and was like, yeah, it's a good point. Okay, instead I'm going to pray that all those people get saved and come here instead. I said, there you go, I can get behind that line of thinking. That's, that, that's the way, and they were a prayer warrior. I said, you absolutely, I, I'm with you there. I want people to know the love and the life and the freedom that Jesus brings. See, God created you and I with a free will. Don't ask me why, but he did. If you and I were the creator, we would not have done that. We would have made sure that there was a part of creation that forced everybody to worship and follow the one who created them. But God didn't. God created us with a free will. One of the results of that is he only gets true, committed followers who want to follow him. God wasn't interested in forced servitude. He was interested in it coming and flowing from our hearts. Can I hear an amen? Did you know Christians are the most persecuted uh, people group on planet Earth every single year? Every year I go through the, you know, there's these organizations who track this stuff and I read their updates all the time. Uh, And it's just, it's heartbreaking and sad to see what Christians live through in other parts of the world. You and I can often be blind to it because it doesn't happen here. Although I think the day is coming where some persecution is going to arrive on our shores. Uh, Christians are the, one of the most persecuted, are the most persecuted group. It doesn't take a whole lot of connecting the dots to realize that some, if we allow intolerance, if we allow censorship, if we allow the erosion of freedoms right here in North America, we're going to be one of the first groups targeted when governments get put in place who have no problem shutting down opposing opinions. We see it all the time on university campuses and in the media in Hollywood. I get that. But if this ever takes root in the halls of power, you and I may actually face some real persecution. Are you going to be willing to stand for Jesus even when it's not politically allowed or politically correct? I know I sure am. And I hope you pray for the persecuted church around the world who live it every day, every week, every year, being persecuted for the cause of Christ. So I will support freedoms, your freedom to think, your freedom to speak, your freedom to ask questions, your freedom to worship, because I believe in that value universally. Am I making sense here this morning? It's one of the reasons I have zero problem at all opposing racism and anybody who shares racist thoughts or ideas. Every single human being was created in the image of God. Let that sink in for a minute. Every color, every language, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, we are all created in his image. Why on earth would we think it's okay to talk down to certain people groups that are created in the image of God? We're all equal. I don't believe we should be allowed to kill babies. I don't believe we should be allowed to discriminate. If you allow God to get into your heart, this is the sort of value shift that takes place. This is the sort of value shift that begins to happen uh, in your life. Now, <clears throat> we got to make sure, if we're going to live successfully for the cause of Christ, we got to make sure we're dealing with real life. In other words, our real, the, the real condition of our heart. We're great at deceiving ourselves. We're very good at tricking everybody else, but even ourselves, we're good at deceiving ourselves and thinking that there are things that are acceptable to stay in our heart, but really they're not. Next weekend, I'm going to preach on everybody's favorite topic, (laughs) sin. (laughs) Sin. Don't don't go home and say, well, I'm not signing up for that one. (laughs) I want to stay on the other side of a TV screen for that. No, God has just been, God's been convicting me and speaking to me and just kind of opening my eyes to what it is he's looking for from his bride as we live through such an interesting time like this. Uh, And and sin we absolutely have to take seriously. Did you know that people's social media feeds are generally speaking just a highlight reel of their life? It's it's not generally real life. 
I don't want your social media feed to be real life. I have no interest in you complaining about your boss or uh, you know, showing a bowl of cereal. Like It's meant to be highlight reels. It's meant to be a great pick or an amazing event at a sporting event or whatever. I get it. But let's make sure we don't go through life thinking uh, that that's reality. The reality of who you and I are is right in here. Right in our heart and right in our mind. Write this down. You really are who you are in private. You really are who you are in private. Some of you English police might want me to flip that around. Who you are in private is who you really are. However you want to write it, I don't care. But who you are in private is who you truly and really are. This goes for me too, right? So don't look at me like, oh, that's a sucky thought. (laughs) Yeah, I know it is. But we've got to get real before God. We've got to get real in our hearts. What is your self-talk like? We all have self-talk. We all have an ongoing running dialogue in our minds, some more than others. But we all have a self-dialogue, a self-talk. What is your self-talk like? What are your real priorities in your heart? Again, this is stuff that only you and God know the answer to. Because you know what your self-dialogue is like. You know what truly goes on in your heart. How much does the gospel matter as something to live out daily? Or is it something that it's good enough to show up here once a week and check it off the list? Or am I truly in a relationship with a father who loves me, who sent his son to die for me, to forgive me, to offer me eternal life, and to give me a life that matters more than ever right now? What is the gospel like to you? What do you pray about? Do you go into each day looking for an opportunity to represent the love of Jesus? See, there's all these questions we've got to get real with ourselves on and ask ourselves on. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord doesn't see things the way you do. People judge by the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You can say amen to that. God looks at the heart. Okay, so uh, we're talking about values and how univer- values who are, that are true values can be universally applied. So let's go to number two, values that become behaviors. My dad shared some great examples of this in his message, and I'm just going to pull them out. Floyd and Sally deciding to move overseas. They could have said, God God wants us to reach hippies that are traveling over to India right now. We really believe God wants us to to reach them. Oh, wow. Okay, what are you going to do about that? Um, I think we'll just stay here in California and watch TV four nights a week because we couldn't possibly be an inconvenience for the cause of Christ. If that was their response, then it would be a statement of truth that never actually shifted into a value or a conviction. Instead, they packed everything up, they left California, and they went and moved to Afghanistan in the 1970s. Nobody else you know was moving to Afghanistan back in the 1970s to reach people for Jesus. But it became a conviction, a God-planted conviction in their heart, and they acted on it. I love this. Caitlin Rex, who I think I saw here somewhere this morning, yeah, there she is with her whole, whole fam. She posted this on Instagram a couple weeks ago. Living out the gospel should be a joy, not a burden. If you are doing those hard things for the sake of the gospel, keep going and know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Can I hear an amen from somebody this morning? The joy of the Lord is your strength as you sacrifice and you live for him. How about the invitation my dad shared about? An invitation to a liver dinner. God can even use crazy things like that. I wonder what it would be like if we all lived our lives with a a belief that we may not have a lot of time to share the good news with someone. These people, these women who invited him to dinner, for all they knew, that was their only shot. That's why they asked a couple times. They didn't let him just walk away without coming because they thought, we're never going to see this guy again. He's going to pass through Kabul and keep on going. I remember years and years and years and years ago, somebody came to our church uh, one evening for a service, and I met them, I saw them, I you know, didn't recognize them, went and said hi. And while we were chatting, somebody else in our church kind of walked by, and, they, and these two people saw each other and were like, hey, you go here? And they're like, yeah, you go here? And, and the person who it was their first time, come to find out, they worked together for like 15 years, and they didn't know that the person even went to church. And I remember the person in our church coming to me privately later, super convicted, and like, that is embarrassing. I've been working with this person 15 years, and they don't even know I'm a Christian. What am I doing? I get you don't want to walk into work the first day and just start smacking people with your Bible. 
But sometimes we use that as an excuse to let a, a month turn into six months, to a year, to five years, to a decade, to two decades, to three decades, without ever sharing the good news or asking spiritually-based questions. You don't know how long you have to share with somebody. How about the third thing my dad talked about? <clears throat> this little gospel of John right here. This is the actual one that he got from that cult member uh, on his journey. The person literally did this. Okay, come on over here for a second, babe. Let's, I'm going to do a quick role play. Okay, this is what happened. Hey, uh, have you read any uh, of the Bible anytime lately? You can say uh, no to this. <laughs> impromptu. We didn't rehearse this. I'm literally going to ask the questions and give her the answers. You're, you're just, uh, yeah, just copy me. Oh, okay. Would you be interested? Like, do you have any interest in reading the Bible? I have this little, little piece of it. It's called the book of John, but I would happily give it to you if you thought you might be interested, and you can say sure. Sure. <laughs> there you go. Enjoy. Okay, hey, bring it back. How many think that right there requires 20 years of training, tons of classes, tons of prayer meetings, uh, tons of Bible classes to, to do that right there? How many think that was super hard, what just happened? That was what a cult member did to my dad, and it got the word of God into his hands and into his mind and into his heart. One of the reasons I often share, all the time I share little scriptures and nuggets from my Bible reading on Instagram is because I know, I know because I have conversations with neighbors and people who don't go here. People are watching and reading, and I believe that it's seeds being sown. What do you have in your hand? Something this small, this little, that you can offer, that you can share, that you can talk to somebody else about. See, our culture has this mindset that life is all about me. If the Apostle Paul were here, he would say, no, it ain't. It's not about you. It's about loving God, and it's about loving people. I've had amazing conversations. I can think of five different neighbors I've had five different conversations with since this whole coronavirus thing started. All five of them have five different views and opinions on the world, and I do a lot more listening and very little talking because I love that there's a new dialogue. Conversations have gotten into the afterlife, the meaning of life, heaven and hell, why are we here? I mean, all sorts of amazing conversations, and my heart and my mindset is fixed on wanting to represent the love of Jesus. I do not care if my personal opinions on different political issues or different things things vary from theirs, that's not important. I'll let them talk it out, and then we'll have a deeper conversation on something that matters. Christians, you've got to refocus right now. There is an openness around us that I have never seen before. We've got to refocus what truly matters. We cannot miss this Kairos moment because we're too distracted talking about all the weird events that have come with the Kairos moment can't miss the Kairos moment because we're too distracted. Did you know that you're in a spiritual battle 365? All of us are in a spiritual battle 365. In fact, we are seeing in the natural right now an outplaying of how intense the spiritual battle is being ratcheted up right before our eyes. Again, if you're looking at life just naturally and through the world's wisdom, you'll miss it. There's a spiritual battle raging and it's intensifying as we speak. Let's focus ourselves on the love and the gospel of Jesus so we can help point people where it matters. Because let's be real, we know our culture. Once this is over, once this Cairo season is done, everybody will go right back to being distracted with sports and with movies and with Hollywood and with their careers and with their jobs and blah, 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 blah. This is a, an appointed Kairos time from God, and we have got to be willing to put ourselves out there and share the love and the good news of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Number three, I'm actually doing pretty good. Rooster's in the back looking at that clock nervously. Number three, unity of heart, mind, and purpose. God needs a unified church gathered around his cross if we're going to have the heart for the mission. <clears throat> Spiritual battles are only one in the presence of God. Period, end of story. They're only one in the presence of God. The early church disciples modeled for us what this should look like. And, and they lived in a crazy time. They lived in an insane time. They lived in a time way crazier than this. I mean way crazier. Every time they came out of that upper room, they thought this could be the end for us. We could get sawed in half by the end of this day. This is the sort of time they lived in, and they all, in fact, did meet violent deaths, heads being lopped off and all kinds of stuff. They lived in a nutty time, and yet they remained unified around the cause of Jesus. 
Acts 2, 42 to 47. I feel like I'm reading this a lot this year, but hey, that's fine. God wants me to, so I will. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them, and they performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. They met together in one place, so they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And God added to their fellowship every single day people who were being saved. They were devoted to fellowship, to sharing, to praying, to caring. We know that God will bless us when we're unified, but he also tells us he will resist the proud. It's vital that we're unified as the battle intensifies. Think of a military that is unified. They are absolutely unified in their purpose and their mission and the strategy with which they will carry it out. I'll get into a bit of this next week. I want to share a warning with you here quickly. Beware of false unity. Beware of false unity. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to live in harmony with each other. Let no division be in the church. Say, in the church. That means us right here. Let no divisions get in here. But be of one mind, united in thought, and united in purpose. Acts 4.32, all the believers were one in heart and in mind. Philippians 2.2, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving each other and working together with one mind and purpose. 1 Peter 3.8, finally all of you should be of one mind. Are you, are you getting the idea here on one mind? One mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. This sampling of scriptures on unity continually talks about being unified in our mind, our thoughts, our purpose, and our hearts. This is what true unity looks like. I'm sure some of the disciples liked their bread buttered and some didn't. That didn't matter. They were unified in thought. Again, I'll get into some of the specifics on this next week. If we're going to disciple and reproduce followers of Jesus, it has to be, there has to be uniformity. Our culture hates uniformity, but it's the only way to accomplish the mission of Jesus. We can't be reproducing disciples, some who think abortion is good, some who think it's not. You know, some who think it's uh, fine to uh, you know, not be allowed to meet and worship. I don't mean during a virus, I mean just normal life. Others who think we should always be here every single day. There has to be some uniformity to what we do, and it has to be based on the Word of God. Unity can't be faked on the outside. That's really what I want to share with this. It's an inward attitude. It happens in our heart. The enemy wants to bring some little divisions and some little rifts right here, and he'll use a weird season like this to do it. The very last, last line in 1 Peter 3, 8 there gave us the tip. Keep a humble attitude. Turn to your neighbor without you know, spitting all over them and say, keep a humble attitude. You're all sitting with your family anyway. You're used to spitting all over each other. Keep a humble attitude. Sometimes we try to pretend we're in unity, but our hearts and our minds ain't there. Don't, don't leave that. That's like what the Pharisees used to do. We've got to let him deal with our hearts. We must be unified as a church. Every A team, every C group, every single person in leadership, every small group leader, every elevate leader, motivate, staff, everyone. We've got to be unified in the cause of Christ right now. Now more than ever, we need to be unified the way the early church leaders were because there's a world out there with tons of questions, looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for purpose. What good is it if we're too busy in here arguing about a bunch of non-important things and we miss the Kairos season that God has appointed? Are you receiving this here this morning? The enemy wants to open a a, a door in this type of a season and get into our hearts. I'm going to take a look here. I'm going to skip a part. You're welcome, Josh, and I'm going to save that for next week. I'm going to skip number three, and I'm going to go right to number four and finish this up. Number four is create in me a clean heart. God, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. Everything that God has called you and I to do 
is impossible to do unless we let God deal with the deepest parts of our heart. Every fear, every doubt, every comparison, pride, selfishness, anxiety, unforgiveness, bitterness, you name it. We've got to let him get to the deep parts of our heart. Don't let those things sit there and think that you're good enough. God wants you to experience freedom in your heart. His spirit will transform you and his word will equip you. Psalm 139 verse 24 says, Search my heart, O God, and see if there's any sinful way within me. We all should do this all the time. I get scared when I ask people, like, what sin uh, are you struggling with right now in your life? And they say, yeah, nothing. I'm like, yowzers. How about being completely oblivious? Is that a sin? Because you are completely oblivious. We're humans. There's things we're going to struggle with, all of us. This is a convicting word. I get it. But this is a Cairo season. God doesn't want us to miss it. Now more than ever, our families, our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, our community needs to see the unified love of Christ flowing out of this place. The unified love of Christ flowing out of your life seven days a week. <clears throat> if this tiny little gospel of John could help transform a life, I'm not sure our church would be here today if it wasn't for the whole big long journey that took place that landed my parents here when they did as the pastors. I, you know, only God knows. But the fact that they met Jesus and he met Jesus through this has now impacted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families forever because of a couple small touches, because of a couple of things that people were willing uh, to step out and do. God wants you and I to say, Lord, I lay down my own desires, my own issues, my own opinions, my own whatever. I lay it down. Deal with my heart because I want to have a unified family, a unified body. I think it's amazing that God's word coming into 2020 was sharpen our focus. Have you ever lived through a year with more distractions in your life? And God said, get ready to sharpen your focus. So we're halfway through the year. What have you accomplished for Jesus so far? What have you sharpened your focus on so far? We've all been living this together. I get it. God has just been kind of recalibrating me in the last month or two. Say, we need to take this word to heart. Sharpen our focus and focus on what matters. He knew this Cairo season was coming. Let's not let it pass us by just getting together and discussing all the crazy, weird, natural things and what we think would be the best way forward and what things we like or we don't like. That's fine. I have no problem with all of you in a room this size with this many people. You'll have different thoughts and opinions on it. I welcome all of them. That's great. That's not what we're living for, though. We're living for the cause of Christ. We're living for the purpose of Jesus. How many would, I'd like you to close your eyes here this morning. I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions, and then at Gage Park, they'll be able to uh, follow this up with uh, uh, just a prayer time themselves down there. But I want to ask everybody here and online a couple questions. How many would say this morning that you can acknowledge that you so far maybe haven't been as intentional as you should be in this Cairo season to be looking for opportunities and sharing the love of Jesus with people? Let me see your hand if that's you you realize, I've just gotten so busy and distracted, and I get it. I mean, this has been a weird year. I appreciate your honesty. Come on, I love that. I love it. Second question I'd like to ask is, how many would say that you realized you've maybe allowed your heart to get a bit hard, and there's a bit of just an edge that's developed, and the enemy has actually some of his distraction and division plan maybe is starting to work a little bit. And you're realizing today in the presence of God that your heart isn't quite as soft and pliable as it should be. Can I see your hand if that's you? Again, come on, I love your honesty, church. I love that you guys are such an honest church. This is, the, this is one of the steps needed to become all God has called us to be. Honestly evaluate where we are. We're going to take a few minutes and just pray. We'll keep going online here, but uh, Gage Park, uh, you'll have your host come up and uh, you can lead the place in prayer uh, at that location. And we're going to pray that in both groups, we encounter the power and the presence of God this morning. 
we encounter the change that God wants to bring into the deepest, most hidden, secret areas of our heart. And I want to invite all of you back at Gage Park and at home. I invite you back next weekend because the section I missed is really the section I want to nail. That's why I skipped it because I don't have enough time to do it justice today. We'll pick this up next weekend. Gage Park, we love you. You guys can take over from here. Those of you here at Westmount, I'd like you to stand up with me this morning. I would like you to lift your hands up to the Lord. As the piano plays, I want you just to invite the Holy Spirit into the most inward parts of your heart. Speak up with your own words and say, Lord, here I am. Here's my heart. I invite you today to come and speak. I invite you to come and touch. I invite you to come and heal my heart. Transform my heart. Soften my heart once again. Next weekend, we'll get into the whole idea of our hearts like a garden, and we are responsible for the condition of the soil. Lord God, right now, we come into your presence this morning, and we say, Lord, come and soften our hearts. Come and refocus our hearts on you. We're not going to give the enemy the uh, satisfaction of sowing division and getting us distracted during a Cairo season, but we are going to be unified in thought, in heart, in mind, and in purpose. Is Jesus... You modeled this for us. You talk about legit distractions or legit excuses, and yet you managed to push through them all to get to that cross. You will help us stay focused on what matters here. With every hand lifted before the Lord right now this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and would touch your heart. The Holy Spirit would come and touch your mind. Lord, we repent right now of any division we've allowed into our hearts. We will go and make things right with someone we need to make something right with. Lord, we repent for maybe being too distracted, and this has been a distracting season, I get it. But God, this morning we say our focus is back on you. Our focus is on your word. Our focus is on your presence. We are going to sharpen our focus because there are people right outside this building who need the love of Jesus, who need the hope that you offer. We're not going to miss it, God. We are not going to miss it, but we are going to be unified in our pursuit of you, in our pursuit of your presence. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, I, your spirit, I can sense your spirit working in people's hearts. Do a deep work this morning. Let this be a start of a work that go, we go home and this whole week, Lord, keep on doing heart surgery. Keep on getting into the deepest, inmost parts of our heart. because we want nothing but you. We want a revival to break out in this city. We want a revival to break out in this nation. We see the enemy pushing and we see the spiritual battle intensifying, but we know, God, you are always victorious. We know, Lord, that you are going to bring about a, a returning to you in our culture like we have not seen before. And we wanna be a part of it, Lord God. So this morning, we shift our focus fully back on you. Jesus, you're good. Just stay in this atmosphere here for a minute, just, just as you are, as I ask one more question. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus personally, but you'd like to start your relationship with him today, I would love to pray with you, and you can start your journey. You can know him personally. If that's you, can I see your hand? If you're here and you would like to pray, just lift your hand up good and high so I can see you, if that applies to you this morning. If this applies to you online, you can click right there on the, on the link on the home page and you can let us know. Anybody here like to pray this morning and start your own journey with Jesus? I know some of you have your hands up, you know, praying, but if this is you, just wave at me so I don't miss you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we love you this morning. We thank you that you've come and met with us. Right from prayer, right on through this whole time we've had together, we have met with you and your presence. Lord, and I pray that we would all leave here and we would allow you to continue to do deep work in our heart. The stakes are too high for us to miss this. The stakes are too high for us to live just for our own selfish ideas or pleasures or whatever. We want to be unified just like those early disciples were. 
you will help us live through a season like this. You will help us to not just survive, but to bring your good news to people around us. Lord, I thank you for a body. I thank you for a church here that is so committed to your cause that we're willing to let you get into the deep areas of our heart. Forgive us for those who we have not yet uh, forgiven, the bitterness we've allowed to, to remain in our hearts. Forgive us for getting just preoccupied with uh, whatever, a whole bunch of different things. Forgive us for maybe not sharpening our focus and, and realizing that Cairo seasons are temporary appointed times. They don't last forever. We don't want to miss this. We don't want to miss this. We love you this morning. And everyone said, amen. Well, how many sense the presence of God touching you, speaking to you, doing something deep in your heart this morning? Guys, I love you. I love the fact that you're willing to respond to questions like that. Like, yeah, come on, I know. I got to let, let him do what he needs in my heart. That's what is required for us to truly live for the cause of Christ. I'll merge this with sin next week somehow. I guess heart and sin, they go together, right? Uh, we'll merge these two things together uh, next weekend. Uh, I'm believing God that he is it, literally, as we speak, birthing something brand new here. Amen, church? Come on, we love you guys. Why don't you put your hands together and just tell the Lord how much you love him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Head on home, get signed up for next week. Uh, we will see you back here. Have an amazing, amazing week, church. God bless you.